Hello, this is uh, Dan Shea with Veterans for Peace Forum. Um, uh, the one thing I want to do is just uh, recognize that we have this program every fourth Saturday of the month, uh, and I want to recognize my producers Kelly Labonte and Jim Lockhart. We've been doing this for seven, eight years now, and uh, we just want to make sure that people. We want to thank the people out there for continuing to tune in, uh, as we want to present veterans' voices and local community voices about uh, the issues that are affecting veterans and people who have been, uh, I'm, I'm getting a feedback here, I'm sorry, um, but I'm, um, I just wanted to, to make sure that uh, people realize that these voices are important and that we need to uh, uh, continually allow people to have an alternative view of what's going on faced with the media that we have today. Uh, and saying that, I just, you know, I found out there was a demonstration today. I didn't know about it till I came in here, uh, which was, or demonstration or celebration uh, for the anniversary of uh, MLK's uh, March on Washington. I know that with Veterans for Peace uh, nationally, they're going to be doing uh, uh, um, a project on that. Uh, and it says Veterans for Peace joins uh, United Peace for Peace for Justice for the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, Shining Light for Peace, Jobs, Justice, and Freedom. This is from August 21st to August 28th. Friday, August 24th, uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial at 8 p.m. Saturday, which was today, uh, the 14th in, uh, in Constitution between 8 and 10 a.m. And there'll be various events going on throughout the day, so we're going to be hearing more about that if you check your um, local alternative media online or uh, Democracy Now! on Monday, I'm sure we're going to hear more about it. Uh, another event that's going to be coming up is, is the March Against the Drones. Uh, March Against the Drones, called MAD, International Action, September 11, 2013. Um, we also have a link on Veterans for Peace. You see the, uh, on the screen we have it up there for you. For Veterans for Peace, if you just check the action button uh, link, you can go to the uh, International Action, Occupy Action Group, and, uh, and connect to more, more events that are coming out uh, throughout the year. Um, I thought there was another event that I had up there. Uh, <clears throat> there's also on Veterans for Peace, uh, as we all know, just here last Wednesday, um, I don't know if you all know, but uh, we had Badly Manning, who has been uh, facing trial for uh, aiding and abetting the enemy for releasing uh, uh, documents to Wiki WikiLeaks, um, was just sentenced uh, in a trial. Uh, though he was facing uh, serious charges, one of the major charges uh, for uh, espionage was basically uh, um, commuted, I mean, was thrown out by the judge, and uh, he is uh, still, but he, he pleaded guilty to 10 lesser charges, was sentenced on Wednesday, August 21st, and uh, to 34 years. So we had a demonstration at uh, Pioneer Square at 6 p.m. We had 20 to 50 people out there, uh, and I was just telling uh, my guest here, Quincy, that, uh, you know, it's amazing. We're looking at the, uh, the roll in here, and you're seeing Forty to 50,000 people in the streets uh, for various actions we've had over the years. And uh, we had so few people come out on this very, very, very tragic day of a, of a young man who wants to be called, not uh, Bradley anymore, but Chelsea. Um, Chelsea Manning, uh, he's uh, <clears throat> transsexual and, and has called for the government to uh, uh, start going through um, uh, hormone shots to become a woman. He's felt, he says, I am a woman. He wants you to use, she wants you to use all pronouns, female pronouns, when talking about her. So, no matter what, this is going to be uh, uh, an amazing case. But I think uh, people have to understand what has happened here. A little bit here is that, you know, uh, Chelsea Manning uh, sentenced to 35 years for releasing a massive cache of sensitive documents to WikiLeaks. Of course, we've seen uh, uh, Adrian Assange locked up in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy in London uh, as the government pursues him uh, for releasing those documents to other news medias throughout uh, various countries. 
the detail the, these um, many of these documents were detailing the routine killing of civilians by US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and you have to remember here that you know three some 3000 plus people died because of 911 4,000 soldiers died in the Iraq war. Uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians died in those wars. Uh, Four million refugees. Um, more soldiers have died from suicides than in these wars combined. And uh, when you think about that, you know, we have right now the most recent report I saw 690,000 uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, brain traumatic injury um, claims uh, out there. Also we have uh, the, you know, in 2006 I saw it was like 18 suicides a day. That has just came out, uh, the most recent reports, it is now up to 22 suicides a day from veterans. Uh, we have, uh, that's a, a major tragedy on our hands not just these wars, but the innocent people and lives that have been lost in these wars. Uh, VIP has a petition online uh, so that dealing with uh, Bradley Manning's, uh, um, uh, Chelsea Manning, I have to remember that <laughs> each time, Chelsea Manning uh, uh, sentenced to 34 years, uh, we're asking you sign the petition online, you go to Veterans for Peace, all spelled out, www, uh, dot Veterans for Peace, complete name, uh, dot org. It's our national website. And link to the petition and uh, sign that petition. They need some 84,000 signatures by September 20th. And this is calling for a pardon for Bradley Manning. Uh, should there be, you know, I mean, here's a man who is reporting young woman now uh, who was reporting the crimes against humanity and if you realize one of the things that struck me the first time of these videos was the collateral damage video which came out in which a uh, helicopter crew you could hear them speaking it was on sort of a YouTube um, as they were reporting in and calling out uh, uh, for permission to shoot at a group of men that were walking by. Uh, they were asked if they had weapons. They said they did. Uh, it turns out that they didn't have weapons. They had cameras on their shoulders. They fired into that crowd. They ran towards the side of uh, this building. Uh, they shot them down. A van came by to try and help. They shot into the van. In the van, there were two children. Uh, children were severely wounded. Other veterans on the ground came by. One veteran actually went in and saved those children. I don't know how they're doing today, uh, but. Uh, at the time, they had, he had taken them to the hospital and they survived. Uh, this, this was the beginning of the so-called Bradley Manning uh, WikiLeaks uh, release of uh, reports that were happening in Iraq. And it angered people all over the world. But that wasn't what that seemed to bother them the most. The thing that bothered them the most are the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of documents that were released uh, which, you know, for us, you or I, would be, uh, you know, saying something bad about our guy, next door neighbor. They're talking about ambassadors saying something. There were lies. They, they would tell the public one thing about what was going on in the war, and then their uh, official memos in between that they were emailing to each other uh, said something else. And what it did is it revealed the lies that they were telling us about the war. And this is the most dangerous thing because the thing that they're trying to do is keep secret their intentions of what's going on. And we need to make sure uh, that this is open to the public. This is why we do and we have alternative media. And today's guest um, uh, is a young man that I met about, uh, uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, we were meeting with a group of uh, Iraqi veterans against the war. Uh, Quincy Davis, I call this the topic of the program, Growing Up Quincy Davis, uh, Inspire, Awaken, and Empower. Quincy Davis is an uh, AK Soul Miner, documentary filmmaker, and hip-hop artist. Quincy, welcome to the program, and uh, it's a pleasure that I've, I got the chance to meet you at that meeting, and we've been crossing paths ever since. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you for having me very much. You're welcome. And, uh, so we, we were just talking about some of these things. One of the things is, one of the reasons I wanted you on here too is because you did a film 
called Subconscious War. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a documentary, a film that you've had up on YouTube and various places. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit and tell us what that is about? Yeah. Um, so I'll tell the story behind yeah, Subconscious War. And I'll say how it first started. I'll begin with how it first started was me and my girlfriend at the time went to see a movie called Inglorious Bastards mm. by Quentin Tarantino. And in that movie, towards the end of the movie, the climax of it, I think Go we're... Ahead. We're getting a break in. Of we're some getting some sound here. Go ahead. Towards the end of the movie, there's a climax, climactic scene where the main characters are hiding out outside of a movie theater. And inside this movie theater, there's a room full of Nazis and they're watching a propaganda film. Right. And this is in Germany during World War II is where the movie takes place. So in this scene, they lock all the doors, they have explosives set up, and then all the main characters bust through the balcony and start shooting all of these Nazis. And it's a massacre, these explosions go off, and it's just this scene, you know, um, Quentin Tarantino, he's kind of sometimes he's a, a master little, at it, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, you know, it's a little violent sometimes, so, you know, it was a powerful scene and um, of this massacre. And in the movie theater I was in, all the people started hooting and hollering and cheering. Mm. And right at that moment, I, f I said something, this feels really weird to me. This is really, this is really strange feeling. I didn't, I couldn't put my finger on it at the time. But I knew that that meant something to me and I had to do something. And I didn't really know what it meant, so mm -hmm. I left. And then as I was leaving, I realized it had something to do with the violence that my own country um, was perpetuating, was, um, was inflicting on you know, places like Iraq and, and in the Middle East, you know, the, the, the perpetuation of, of this violence right here in this moment, at this time, while we were watching this, this film, this is actually taking place in reality. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was kind of like the seed of the whole project, and I knew that I had to make something um, from there. Yeah. So then the second, I started working on it, and I started doing a little research, and it wasn't until about six months later where I was watching Democracy Now! And I saw they showed the premiere of the WikiLeaks video. I mean, I don't know if I should say premiere, but it yeah. was the first time it was kind of shown to the public as far as I knew of. Collateral damage. Yeah, yeah right. That, um, and so I saw that and, I, and it really affected me. It was, it was very powerful. Um, I'd never seen anything like it, you know, to, to see um, and also to hear the dialogue between right. the helicopter pilots and the chain of command in the base, right? So that was something that I knew I had to use this footage along with this idea somehow, right? So at that point, um, at that point, I, I thought to myself, what, see, I, I thought to myself, what would Americans be doing at the same moment that this is taking place? I think it was in 2009 in Iraq. Um, where this where this one event took place, and we know that these type of things happen, like you know, every day in Iraq. Um, that's war. That's what war is. So I asked myself, what are people in America doing? And I would guess that most of them are watching TV. So I, uh, in my VCR, I put in a, a blank tape and I recorded some prime time TV on uh, channels of BET and. Uh, Comedy Central and a couple other channels during prime time and I just wanted to you know as an observer see what people were watching right see what they were taking in to their minds at the same moment as this is taking place so from there I uh, I gathered some footage and sort of put it together I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it but um, I'm an editor I started out editing so I like to work that way where I gather all this material and then 
in that creative process, see what happens, see what I can make out of it. So that was the start of the project. I mean, that was the main um, foundation for the project. Mm -hmm. And then the third phase, and then I sort of set it aside for about a year. And then the third phase of the project was after I, s I got into the work of John Trudell. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he was very influential on me. Tell um, people who John Trudell is. John Trudell is a, a Native American activist, poet, um, musician. He was a big part of um, the AIM movement in the 70s. And he was, um, he was a part of the, the movement when they took over Alcatraz. He was the spokesperson over the radio. So he was, you know, he's really been involved in the activist uh, movements. And then more recently, he took on, he sort of transitioned into music and poetry and um, also, you know, speaking, you know, um, the talks he, he gives and, um, you know, he has a CD, for example, DNA, Descendant Now Ancestor which is him talking, and I would highly recommend that for anyone. Um, it's, it's really powerful stuff. So I saw this documentary, Trudell. I would also recommend that. That's, you can probably find that online for free, Trudell. Or check in with uh, Jim and Kelly, because our producers have interviewed uh, Trudell many times. Yep. And, uh, you know, just uh, check in with us, and uh, we'll 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 let them know. Uh, you can contact me at uh, djshea at hotmail com, and we'll put you to any links at dealing with uh, 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 John Trudell. Right, and that was, that was a powerful interview. The one I saw shot here in Portland. So um, it was after seeing Trudell, I was like, it it, it was a whole new level of understanding for the whole, regarding the system. And it took it to a whole nother level that had to do with spirituality, mm -hmm. which I was just really, I was sort of through a passageway of a really dark time in my life. And I was beginning to awaken and take on these teachings mm -hmm. that were, that changed my life, um, that, that have to do with the Native American, the natives of this land, of this land that we all, we are on right now. Um, it was a book, uh, Black Elk Speaks. Oh, which John, uh, I love that. Yeah, it, I, it was after I read that. Yeah. Then I saw Trudell, um, that, and then I, from there, I was like, okay, yeah. I got it. I downloaded every single um, interview he gave, and you know anything I could find, and just really started to take in this whole new level of understanding related to all this stuff with the system and energy and how it all works. And so that was on a, a trip I took where I discovered all this and then I headed back to Portland. And then it was, this was in January of 2011. I just, there was a point where I just sat down and started working, just working to finish this project. I was like, now is the time. And I just went all out for like, I would say three weeks. I was just, totally focused on finishing this project. And I uh, showed it to a few friends and got some feedback and then finished it. And um, finished it, did a screening at the, I was living in an artist community at the time. So I did a screening down in the chapel for, for friends and family and also released it on YouTube. And that was my biggest project. So any Today. of you folks out there watching this and you want to see that, go to Subconscious War on YouTube, Quincy Davis, and you're going to see the film that we're talking about. Yeah, type in Subconscious War. Subconscious And it will show up, Google search. You talked about you were going through some difficult times. You said you were born and raised here in Portland? Or, yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We're, we're both natives. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, as well as reading your bio, you you very open about you went through gangs and drugs and all this stuff as you were growing up. How did that process go? I mean, you're you telling me I can see where the change is when you're talking about this sort of spiritual moving, but at the time, where was your head at? How old were you? Yeah, 
Well, first off, I say I wouldn't. I didn't. I, I wouldn't say I got totally into gangs. Yeah. Um, because I know there's people who have gotten into a lot worse things than me. Yeah. But I definitely. It was around. Um, it was around the age of 21, 22. Um, I was. There was a time where I, I went to a year of college and then came back. And it, when I was in college, I started to get into more drugs and, um, you know, alcohol and addictions. And um, it started to go downhill. And so when I came to, back to Portland, I went into a phase of, you know, a lot of isolation and depression and substance abuse and addiction um, on different levels. And then for... I don't know, a year and a half or so, there was a point where I just couldn't, I didn't want to do, I couldn't be isolated anymore. So I, I looked to my friends who I grew up with and they were at the time really starting to get into drug selling, um, armed robbery, um, pimping, this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to be a part of that. There was a time where I was like, okay, this, you know, this is something rather than I felt like I was, you know, I kind of felt like I was searching for an identity, I guess you could say, didn't know who I was. So I began to, you know, be a part of this. I mean, also the, these, at the time I wasn't thinking like this, but right. this is sort of my looking back and reflecting. At the time I was probably just like, this is, this is these are my friends and, you know, camaraderie. And, um, I know, I know exactly how you feel. I mean, I grew up in poor neighborhood, you know. I mean, I, we were six kids in a two-bedroom house. Uh, neighborhood, most people had three to five kids in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You go from block to block, and it was like, you know, you're stepping in somebody else's turf, you know. And uh, I, I don't know that I thought about whether, whether something was right or wrong at, at that, but I mean, mm -hmm. we would joyride it, take a car and joyride with it, you know. We didn't plan on stealing, we just plan on putting it back, you know, and maybe <laughs> down the street a bit ways and give the, yeah. give the neighbor a little bit of a problem, you know. Uh, but there were people that were, you know, that I was hanging around with at the time that their parents were in uh, prison. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we were gambling and uh, skipping school, um, drinking. Uh, and at the time, we had, you know, the drug scene wasn't a big thing here for us at, at that time, so alcohol was the big thing. Huh. But uh, until I got to high school, this is in grade school, you might, you know, <laughs> grade, <laughs> yeah, school, grade school, serious? yeah. Uh, so I mean, I I know, I, I, and I never thought of hurting anybody, yeah. but I also never thought of the consequences that these things could have done. Now nowadays, yeah. many of the things that I did when I was growing up, uh, uh, a person would be sitting in prison, and um, uh, used to be, you know, I mean. We'd shoplift something. Uh, somehow, my mom would hear about it, mm. and you go back down to the store. You tell Joe uh, the Joe's Market or something where we go down to. You tell Joe that uh, you're sorry and you're going to pay for that, and and we go back in there. You know, the police would bring us to the house and say this would happen, but mm. take you down there, and um, we go back there, and Joe put us to work. Uh. So we were bagging groceries. My brother ended up being a butcher. He started learning how to do butchering for part oh. of his trade for a while. Interesting. You know, but I mean, the neighborhood took care of oh. us in a sense. You know, they were watching us. They took care of us, and we're probably privileged that we were white skinned. You know, yeah, because right, if we had been black, they might have been throwing us in the the Huskow at that time. Right. So uh, I mean, there are a lot of different things. At least they thought we were white. I mean, I'm from from black, Latino background. My brother got more shit because he was darker. Mm. You know? Right. <laughs> and yeah, uh, know. so so you end up with those things. The other, I mean, so there's a lot of young people that go through these different transitions in their life. Mm. And we can get through and recognize that we don't need to throw everybody into uh, the uh, criminal justice system. We need to start finding out and listening to what kids need in this world. Mm. Used to have, um, you know, park uh, uh, attendants, and we could go out there park I started learning to work out on the high bars and people would come over and help train us uh, other people went on to actually be do a um, competition in high school later mm. on um, mm. yeah there's there, you know and then all of a sudden 
they stopped defunding. They funded, didn't have money for it. Mm. Nobody there, nobody to direct the kids. Then there was trouble in the park. Then there mm. was fights, and then there were gangs. And right. then it just it, it multiplied that way. And parents who used to be in the park with their kids were both working two or three jobs, you know? Uh. And so the kids were all left on their own. Right, you know, one thing that I think about that is is what our society is missing is, you know, initiation, mm -hmm. rites of passage. That's right. And, that, you know, we know that the <clears throat> gangs and these other, you know, some say prison is is at least a rites of passage of some kind because that's what we as human beings are seeking, that point from childhood to adulthood, manhood, womanhood, you know, there's, it's very important that there be an experience um, of initiation. So. I agree, I agree. I mean, there's, there, I mean, that part of that though is, uh, there's a problem with it uh, huh. at times, and that is like some parts of initiation is why people join the military. Right, exactly. You know, they, they're missing military. that initiation. They feel that uh, to reach manhood, they have to go through that experience and they come out, they've been initiated into adulthood. Exactly. But oftentimes they're initiated into death and destruction. And that's you know. one of the only options right. in terms of initiation. Right. And you know all those ads that show during your favorite NBA game, right. football game, connected in with all this, you know, video games, those are really influencing these young people's minds who, right. don't, who, who maybe don't have an alternative. That's right. I mean, it'd be cool if they, if they did have an alternative. Well, what got you, I mean, uh, you're not Native American. What's your background if we're, we're looking at your, yeah. your ethnic background? I mean, I'm Hungarian uh -huh. more than anything, um, so Eastern European. And then, I don't know, I, I might be I don't know exactly all mm -hmm. my ancestry. You're like me. Yeah, and so that's a part of my journey, I think, is, is discovering all that, and I still have yet to do all my research. But I'm mostly Hungarian and some Romanian. Um, oh yeah, Wales. I have uh, ancestry mm -hmm. from Wales, which I'm proud of, because they're like the poets. The poets warriors. and the revolutionaries. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I feel about the Irish side, you know? Yeah. The exactly. Irish were involved in, and so, and the, and went to Mexico and Latin America and part of the revolutions down there. And uh. my, um, my grandfather was um, um, Boston Irish and his family from Ireland, but he was in construction, went down to work on the Panama Canal. Huh. Married my grandmother who was Panamanian and uh, she'd been working in an orphanage there and he had met her when he went to do some volunteer work. Huh. But he was in his 50s and she was just 20, so. And he had ten kids from a previous marriage. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And my dad, all my uh, aunts and uncles, except for the uh, uncle Frank, the youngest, uh, who passed away a few years ago, uh, were all born in Panama. Huh. Um, so, <clears throat> so I take I take great pride in in all those heritages. And my mom's side were German and German and French and possibly Russian. We we don't know. Mm. But all of them have just basically don't go back any further than them. You know, mm. we don't know because they they came here as in, in sort of that immigrant mentality uh, or the, I should say, U.S. mentality. Uh, you're not immigrants, you're Americans, forget all that stuff. And that, mm. they did. Mm. They just stopped dead. I am mm. an American, that's it, you know. Mm. Well, and I, and, and I understand that feeling and I still hear people say that, wow, this immigrant comes in, he's not an immigrant, he's an American, you know. Well, no, there's, how come they can talk about uh, their, going back to the Mayflower and all the way back to England and the kings and queens and all this shit, and we, we sit there and we have to uh, say, well, that history doesn't mean anything. Well, no, it does mean something. It means yeah. that you know, there's a diversity of people that came together, and we, we shared cultures, we shared ideas and dreams together, and we tried to make a better nation here. And now we're facing people who are trying to take us back to that. Speak English only. Uh, close off the borders. Don't let people come in. You know. Yes. And it's say, like it's saying, no, we're some sort of superior nation, and we don't want a poison the well with all these other people here. Yeah. Uh, I just I I think that's 
I, I have so much problems with most of that uh, mentality, and, um, and, and we all and we all do. But one of the, I want to get back to okay. your your film. So you became a filmmaker. How did how did you get into filmmaking? You said you were taking some classes too. Uh, you were going to college. Is that where your interest in film started, or actually um, earlier than that? Earlier than that. My dad is a cinematographer, wow. a freelance cinematographer, which is a cameraman. So I grew up playing with the camcorder with my friends um, at, at a certain point. Then I taught myself how to edit on iMovie at a certain point and just would make you know videos with my friends, having fun, playing basketball. And then I took, as a sophomore in high school, I took a digital video editing class at the Northwest Film Center. Mm -hmm. And that was my first introduction to filmmaking, teaching. You know, it's like a college level class, so I was right. a young person. But I had a really great teacher. Really, um, I think she was really influential on me. What was her name? NEA Weisberg. Good, Not let people know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I don't know what she's doing these days. I don't no. even know if she's around. That's a shout out though. <laughs> yeah, shout out to NEA. So uh, it was through editing where I realized that I could use these tools. It was like realizing I had a whole palette of tools and paintbrushes. Right. And it was pretty amazing. You know, the, the possibilities were, were limitless. And me, I'm a very visual person. So to be able to layer visuals was how I first started. Um, it's my interest took off from there, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out how I could layer these visuals and then put music to it. So a lot of my early stuff was ex sort of experimental music video type of stuff. And it was that class and it was NEA, it was the final project. And I was, I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. I was trying to figure it out, what the subject was gonna be and I, j I showed her a project that I just did for fun. Mm -hmm. And she looked at it and, she's, and it was kind of a weird, it was kind of a dark, weird experimental type of video. And she, um, and she said, this is your project. This is your final project right here. She really encouraged me to follow my intuition, follow my heart with creativity. And she was like, keep at it. And that was, that was the start. And from there, I knew what I wanted to do. Well, that, that, uh, another thing I want to do is, is you have a, you brought in a, a tape that we can show here a little bit. Uh, is this a video or your music? Um, this is a music video. Music video? Yeah. And this is uh, what's going on, right? What's going on? Why don't we put that up and we show the other side of uh, this young star. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's called What's Going On? Let's roll. Let's roll it. That, that are held up <laughs> in these esteems, none of these things seem to have any spiritual relationship to life. Yeah, yeah. At times the situation's heavy on my heart, still I rise. Articulate my vision while you feel the vibe. In this manipulation game, it seems I'm ill advised from killing lies. And finally realize it's real lives that bleed. But do we feel they cries? Our dreams televised, sell us lies, and kill what's real inside. Debris, systematic soldiers spray rounds with no precision. Motivation, motivation, globalism, no religion. It seems unspoken television, culture, vision. Protecting broken dreams like codes in prison. Selecting vote elections, but won't connect the dots. Self deception, like followers of pro wrestle plots. Complain you best stop when this game of chess lot. They think they're next to God. Please Police state check the blocks. Invest in stock dollars dropped in, commence the cops. Real revolutionaries know the struggle never stop. Never stop. Real revolutionaries know the struggle never stop. The way that the cancers of greed and, and war, the way that these viruses, these diseases have spread. And no one is really taking responsibility. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? To effectively deal with 
these things. So where the real revolutionaries real power. Hypnotized by the shadow play in front of your eyes. The systematic programming, one with the high energy, predatorial abduction of minds. The seduction of the matrix, put trust in the lies of these elitists. Mass manipulators lead the people. I see the codes like Neo hungry ghosts feed the ego and live lost. Forget to realize what the real is. Rick Ross used to be a prison guard and he still is. Until the killers in the hundred dollar villas who ain't got no feelings. We recognize what the deal is. You swallowing that blue pill and following Masons. Feeding in to the new form of colonization. With some bread and a place up in the matrix. Think you got it all figured out cause there nothing is safe. I don't respect you cause I don't respect the system. I got visions of freedom cause I won't accept the prison. Accept the prison. Yeah. 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 Visions, freedom, cause I'm so whatever this disease of aggression and violence and greed and all, whatever this disease mentality is, it lives in this life system now. It's eating up the spirit, up the spirit of the diseased. When we leave as humans, we go back to being, being, human being. That really means something. But we live in a reality now, we're in a time where I would say to anyone, you know, protect your spirit. Protect your spirit. Protect your spirit because because you're in the place where spirits get eaten. Very very cool, and uh, says a lot in what we've been talking about. You said you saw shot a, a number of the. Those pieces there at the uh, Occupy? Yeah. The police? I shot it all at Occupy at different times. Some of the, some of the footage was um, before the eviction. Uh-huh. A little, only a very small amount was before the eviction. Um, uh, most of, this, of the shots where I'm rapping in front of the camera walking down the riot police was shot after the eviction that evening. And then... The other shots, um, everything else was from the day where they occupy the banks. You mm -hmm. Remember that? Right, yeah. I think it was November 7th or November 12th, occupy the banks. And that was um, the shot where the, they're lined up on, to block people from going across the Morrison Bridge there. Right. That's where that was shot, along with um, a lot of the footage in downtown Portland, that, um, the close-up footage and everything else, which I shot. Yeah, and, there was, and one of the groups uh, with Occupy there uh, was very important. It was Portland Central American Solidarity Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War and Veterans mm -hmm. for Peace were out there helping uh, uh, in Occupy. Uh, a number of, actually, um, the guys that we knew met when we first met, uh, mm -hmm. also uh, part of uh, Occupy, and uh, others are still getting together, and they're still doing work. There's a guy named Micaiah Dutt who I've had on the program working very closely with uh, um, the foreclosure movements. Huh. And, um, and of course, then another hip hop artist and friend of ours, uh, Mike Crenshaw. Uh, we are Oregon, yes. you know, out there all the time. He's been uh, a great uh, friend, uh, uh, a great inspiration to uh, me and everybody else uh, around. Most deaf. Music. Uh, um, often tells a story, and like you said, where are most people sitting in front of that television? And mm. the good place to get, I, I like when you said that, you know, and I had thought, I gotta make film to speak to these people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it's yeah. like a battle for the mind. Yes, amen. It's all about perception of reality. That's what John <clears throat> Trudell talks about, so I feel like that's where I'm trying to get at people, especially the young people. Well. Then the other side of the, the documentary film, uh, you did a piece on uh, Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not done yet. I'm you're working, working on it. it. You started it. And that is called Behind Being? Correct. Right. And uh, so you've done some filming already. You went over to there, what you said, last February? Yep. So no, it was February 20, um, 13, 2012. 2012. Okay. That's right. And just recently, you've been invited to go back to a... a, a Film Festival Fair? or Arts and Culture uh, Festival uh -huh. in Ubud, Bali. And when do you leave for that? Um, October 7th or so. Okay, so that's coming up pretty quick. We're mm -hmm. going to get more footage, I'm sure. Yeah, it's going to be done <laughs> by then. 
So tell us a little bit about the film, uh, what it's about. Yeah. Well, it started when I was, I'll give a brief, um, brief story behind it is, mm -hmm. when I went to Indonesia, I was given the opportunity to go um, from a family friend who has traveled there for 30 years or so back and forth. Mm -hmm. So it was through her and also another friend of hers who is a, is a traveler, world traveler type of person. They sort of helped, they, they got me there and then they also kind of helped me get connected so I could do my own thing as a documentary mm -hmm. person, not knowing exactly what the documentary was going to be about. But I just went out and I started to capture footage of stuff that I was really interested in, which has to do with community and culture, which Bali is deeply rooted in um, culture and community. And it still has that, it still has that alive, very much alive and very much a part of the culture um, going back, um, I guess you could say to the ancient times, there's still, um, that culture is still alive. So to me, that's something really special and I uh, got a lot of footage and then I also got some interviews with people like a master mask carver, um, a master textile artist, um, a hip hop um, hip hop group in Joke, Jakarta, Java, who are keeping the ancient um, tradition alive through hip hop. So I basically got to interview these people. Um, oh, and I also volunteered at a um, a school learning center for underprivileged children. And it was there where I captured this footage of the tradition being passed on to the younger generation, which I think is a very important part of the, the whole documentary is, I think it's about um, just honoring how important that is, that culture that continues on, um, and, and just how, that, how important that is for empowerment and, mm -hmm. and for like knowledge of self and just for being a human being and you know remember who remembering who we are as human beings um, I think that that is something to me is very important and that's kind of what the documentary is about that's good it sounds like a very positive documentary to yeah exactly to people. Uh, I know there's another documentary film that's coming out called The Killing and I think you sent you a link on that on mm. Indonesia, mm. which is about uh, the massacres that took place in uh, like East Timor and other places mm. <clears throat> by these these men that uh, are being interviewed in the film. It's going to be coming here to Cinema 21 here in September fairly shortly, and uh, I'm trying to work up a little uh, get together. As many people who want to show up to the film, I'm going to put up a Facebook. Uh, invite and try to get as many people to go to the film together and then afterwards we can go out and talk about it. But it is where these men who actually were the perpetrators of those bass murders uh, actually talk about their crime. And uh, But they talk about it almost braggingly right. and reenact the film. Right. Um, and there are many questions of whether he should have ever even given them a voice. But the the point of the film is to show you how somebody was thinking and the transition once they, they start go talking through this the one gentleman who's telling his story is um, seems to be realizing that he's done something really terrible and uh, uh, but is doing all kinds of other things to try and hide from that and uh, right. so I right. think it's very very important for people to see what makes monsters in a sense and uh, but monsters can't exist if we don't let them too, and there's a certain part of responsibility that we all have to take in in being informed and educated. It's funny because I just saw a piece in Philadelphia online that was posted there that said um, that they were defunding the schools. They were asking people, parents, to put up six hundred some dollars per child just to be able to keep the schools open. There would be no textbooks, no nothing. And I, I wrote something, uh, whoops, <laughs> I wrote something, that's all right. I wrote something saying that, uh, that, um, that we were becoming like uh, uh, third world uh, schools. And somebody corrected me, you know, and I said, wait a minute, I, 
grew up in the third world and I got a pretty good education and you shouldn't make those kind of comparisons. <laughs> and I knew it, I knew it after I had posted it, I, uh, I was still using my old college terms of uh, economics, you know, uh -huh. third world right, right. Uh, or developing countries or, uh, you know, they have all these different terms. And in fact, actually many of the countries I've gone to where people are um, um, considered uh, factually illiterate, in other words, they can't read and write uh, per se, uh, but through, v through oral traditions actually are much more educated than a lot of people that can have put it, pick up and read and never do <laughs> and never yeah. read the whole story. Yeah. But through, like you were saying, passing down knowledge from father to son, uncle, grandparents, right. exactly. uh, can actually uh, uh, carry a whole tradition of knowledge uh, just by verbal. I, I had friends from Africa who, who knew the whole history of Africa just through verbal. And when I went down to Venezuela, same thing. Right. They could tell me the whole history uh, yeah. of their country. And they could tell me my history that I read about and can't remember because mm -hmm. they had to learn to remember that, tell that story again to somebody else. Huh. So who's more educated? Uh, right. we had, so they were right to correct me, and I apologized. And, right. uh, and, uh, and I think that we, but we have to be wary of where we're putting our money. More right. money for that, and not to schools, not to the arts. Right. Um, these kind of programs that are so important. Well, that's interesting to me. A lot of the stuff that I've been getting into is, I guess you could say, the indigenous way of of knowledge of teaching, and the teachers that I've been able to learn from come across. They talk about how our society is the inside-out society. Mm -hmm. So it's the type of society where the mind tells the heart what to do when the times that we live in, it has to be the heart telling the mind what to do. So I think it has to do with, you know, an imbalance mm -hmm. um, where, the, where the mind is, has to do with ego and stuff like that. When there's a way of actually knowing an embodied wisdom right. is um, much deeper and is actually something that's powerful. And is something, you know, for example, these stories, the olden days, and we all come from this, you know, it's all right. a part of our DNA, these ways of life, um, where the teachings would be passed on through the stories. That which is passed on is actually like genuine power. Right. That's real power that's being passed on. So, yeah, and that power can be continued on. Well, and, and that's something that um, I remember you also have to learn to listen to your body and listen to your gut. Mm. You know, there's a tuition. Uh, I mean, we tell our children, you know, uh, if you're out in the streets and you feel something isn't right, that uh oh feeling, I te tell kids, you know. Mm. Um, I remember those things uh, when I was younger, things that I knew intuitively was dangerous. Um, I, there's a great story Brian Wilson has told that uh, when he was in boot camp, uh, and he was told to take his bayonet and put it into uh, one of these sandbags that was supposed uh -huh. to be a human being. And he couldn't do it. Uh -huh. His gut just told him he couldn't do it. And he didn't know why. I mean, he said, he, I was all but willing to do it. Just my body wouldn't let me do it. And then the DI hit him and knocked him on the ground and started shouting at him and telling him to do it. And that was his first experience of saying something in, inside me resisted killing another human being, mm. the idea of doing it. And mm. I think we all have that, but there's so much information that's thrown at us that it, we kind of unlearn that tuition. And I think right, exactly. going back to what the kind of training uh, that you've been going through and uh, that sort of spirituality uh, is a part of the path to healing. I know mm. many veterans mm. that are going through sweat lodges, mm. uh, many veterans who are uh, doing uh, Tai Chi, uh, mm -hmm. I do that. Um, uh, they go for various other kinds of alternatives to try and seek peace from uh, the, the images that keep popping up in their heads, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see a more positive world. Huh. I want to see one for my granddaughter, you know. It's only just a little over a year now. And, uh, uh, and I see that child instinctively look at the world in such a positive way. 
Oh. And when I do my yeah. artwork, which, which mm -hmm. is strange, I was just telling you, I don't do beauty, I do a statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also had do, I do a lot of death. Oh. I do a lot of, you know, violence uh, oh. with images. Uh, or I'll do a portrait of somebody who's, who has been in the middle of violence. Um, but I'm telling a story, and, and some of my war paintings or drawings or etchings, um, people have said to me, you know, there's death all around you. Hmm. And, uh, and it's because it had been. And, and all these years, since, uh, you know, 1968 when I went in, uh, these images still pop up in my head. Hmm. And, uh, but that little bit of beauty that we need, that little bit of story, that little positive, that spirituality, uh, your stories, mm. the music that you do, right. music that uh, Mike Crenshaw does, uh, all, you know, growing up when we can turn on the radio and hear a song that uh, bring a tear in your eyes mm. uh, from Billie Holiday's uh, Strange Fruit, mm. you know, Nature. to your what's what's going on is yeah. telling people that we need to do something about stopping these wars but there's also something else in this world and I think that something else is you and the other young people that are following and trying people. to say something man yeah you know? exactly I think that's the key right now in the times that we're living in is that, that is recognizing that it's the young people who are going to be the ones that are going to create this this world that we want to see. I mean, I feel like my role is to help to lay that foundation for the next generation, for the next generation to come. And a lot, of, you know, the teachings I've been given, they're rooted in this idea of the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. The idea that we keep in mind, the seventh generation for all our decisions. And I think that's a very powerful principle to live by because you know it's a, it continues on. Mm -hmm. You know, this energy, whatever we do here on this earth and whatever our focus is, it's what we're creating and it's, it's, it's what we're here to do as humans, you know. We're creative right. beings. So it's, I think it's very important to share our gifts. You know, it sounds like that, you know, that's what you're doing. That and tell your story, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, we all have a story. Yeah. And we also need to listen to other people's stories. Yeah. And once we learn to listen and, and talk to each other, um, I think it's, you know, that's another thing about war is that it sends you to some place you don't know the people, the culture, mm -hmm. um, uh, or it's always the other. But when you begin to know the stories of people mm -hmm. from other cultures and other mm -hmm. places, uh, how can you use your tax dollars to buy guns and bullets to kill other people's children. I just I can't conceive that anymore, you know. And uh, and we need to say, uh, you know, you're not doing it in my name because right. I refuse to participate in these wars. I refuse anymore to support those wars in any way that I can to try and stop it. Not just the wars, but the violence on the streets, mm. uh, the violence against the poor, the violence against uh, people of color, the violence against immigrants coming into this country. We want all people to be treated equally and fairly. And I want to thank you so much for coming into this program. And I want to thank uh, Kelly and uh, Jim for allowing us to do this program and for uh, Metro East Community TV for uh, uh, <clears throat> putting this program on for us month after month after month. And uh, we're here on the fourth Saturday of every month want to find out more, you know, tune in to uh, Veterans for Peace, uh, Chapter 72. Uh, check out my uh, email, djshea at hotmail.com. And uh, tune in again next uh, fourth Saturday of the month. Thanks again, brother. Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you.